Okay, I'm back. Woohoo, we're back. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this week's Learning Space. My name is Nicole Gallucci with CosmoQuest. Uh, we bring you a new topic in space or science, astronomy, uh, education and outreach. Um, and I have with me today Rick Feinberg. So, hello. hello there. <laughs> uh, Rick Feinberg is the uh, press officer with the American Astronomical Society, but worked as the editor for Sky, or worked with Sky and Telescope for over 20 years. That's right. I spent the last eight as editor in chief. Right. Excellent. Yes, I loved Sky and Telescope um, when I was a kid. I read it all the time, and tried desperately to be a good amateur astronomer from uh, the heart of New York City, and that was uh, kind of a fail. That's whatever. definitely challenging. It can be done. It can be done, especially if you like the moon. Yes, or planets. Right. <laughs> the coat hanger, asterism. That was about all I could find, pretty much. But. Uh, um, so I wanted to welcome you guys. Uh, I've already said, got a hello from Lourdes in Mexico and a hello from Ulysses in Virginia, who sadly I could not see when I was in Virginia last weekend. So hi, you guys. Um, I am broadcasting from home, so there might be a little bit of a lag again this week. Uh, Pamela Gay and, and Georgia Bracey are both on travel, so, so uh, you, get, you get... How ironic. The I know. is astro travel and, and some of your regular staff are not here because they're traveling. Exactly. That, that's all we do, is travel sometimes. Um, I want to remind you guys, if you want to uh, leave us a comment or a question, uh, we've got the comment tracker running, and you can comment on the YouTube page if you're watching us on YouTube. You can comment on the Google event page or any of the posts on Google+. Plus. I should, be, I should have captured all of those by now as well. Uh, if you're somewhere else and want to use Twitter, use the hashtag learning space. Our uh, comment tracker has a little bit of a lag, so we will get to your question or comment as soon as we can. So uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so Rick, why don't we just dive in? I know you've got uh, quite a storied history in chasing eclipses. Do you mind telling us a little bit about how you got started with that? Yeah, sure. Uh, it started when I was working at Sky and Telescope and in particular for the big 1991 solar eclipse that was going to be visible from Hawaii and from Mexico. Um, I had never seen a solar eclipse before and I'd been working for Sky and Telescope already for five years. Uh, but basically that eclipse was going to be so big it was going to last more than seven minutes and it was going to uh, you know places that are really hot tourist destinations namely Hawaii and Baja California in Mexico. Yeah. And Leif Robinson, the editor of at Sky and Telescope at the time, realized that it was an opportunity to, to mount the biggest eclipse tour in Sky and Telescope's history and that he was going to need everybody on the staff to go. Um, and so this was oh, wow. how I got invited, even though I was a very junior editor at the time, I was invited to go uh, participate in an eclipse tour. Sky and Telescope had been doing tours uh, not just to eclipses, but for example in 1986 they took a tour to the Southern Hemisphere to see Halley's Comet. So they've been doing this for, you know, most of the 80s, I think. Um, but 1991 was the real big breakout. We sent a couple of groups to Hawaii, three or four groups to Mexico, um, and basically every editor on staff, and there were about a dozen of us at that point, uh, all went, got to a company tour. So my first solar eclipse was the, the one that they called the big one, the seven-minute eclipse in 1991. And then I didn't go on another eclipse trip for six years, uh, but in uh, or seven years actually. Uh, but since 1998, I've gone to almost every eclipse. Wow! Wow! <laughs> Starting with Sky and Telescope, and then um, because uh, well, even though I've left Sky and Telescope, uh, I have a good relationship with one of the tour companies that the magazine worked with for many years. And after I left the magazine, they said, "Hey, you know." Would you still like to go on eclipse trips uh, at our expense and see the world? <laughs> yes. and, I, and for some reason, I couldn't say no. Yeah. That's fantastic. So then, so if you're going, so you're going now every year and a half for an eclipse, or do you only hit major average, ones? Okay. Well, uh, just the total eclipses. Um, I actually, um, I have occasionally been offered. Uh, an opportunity, for example, to see an annular eclipse, a ring eclipse, where the moon doesn't completely cover the sun. Um, and I would do that. I've seen one, and they are fun, but they're not nearly as dramatic and exciting as a total solar eclipse. But the time that I was offered an opportunity to go see one of those, I actually had a commitment 
at the same time, so I wasn't able to do it. Um, but basically, I'm I'm going to the total eclipses. Okay. Um, but that's not the only astro travel that I do. I, okay. You know, I mean, uh, well, actually, the the industry uh, has branched out quite a bit. Uh, the first real uh, organized eclipse tours were conducted in the 1970s. Um, a planetarian named Ted Pettis, who I think was in Ohio, uh, he organized uh, the first eclipse cruise in 1973. Wow. Uh, and then it really took off in the 80s, and then, and then 91 you know, caused this big explosion where a lot of different companies got involved. But um, now you have astronomical tours that go to, uh, well, to see comets, as I mentioned, Sky and Telescope took people to the Southern Hemisphere to see Halley's Comet, because even though it would be visible from the North in 1985, 1986, it was going to be much better from the Southern Hemisphere, so uh, I know they, I think they went to Australia. And there were people talking about uh, doing tours to go see Comet Ison this coming November or December. Right. Uh, this is the real bright comet that, that could even outdo Hale Bach. Uh, it could also be a, you know, a fizzle like Kahootek. Uh, but could be great. <laughs> you never know. And, you never know with and, a volatile uh, object near the you sun. You never know. You never know. So, uh, so, so, uh, the so comets, you know, occasionally uh, there are groups that go see the aurora. So they'll take you to Alaska or they'll take you to Iceland. Um, I need to do that. I have not seen. Aurora. <laughs> I've never yeah. I've never gone on a trip specifically to see them. Although okay. I am I am actually planning to go to Iceland next spring. Okay. Um, but the uh, but I've been lucky enough to see two really good auroras from my observatory in New Hampshire mm -hmm. uh, gotcha. when, the, when the sun was really active uh, at the last solar maximum. So you've got aurora tours. You've got the uh, the eclipse tours. Another kind of tour that's um, not as prevalent, but I've, I've seen them, and in fact I, I went on one, uh, was just to visit uh, major observatories because uh, yes. you know the world's great observatories are in places that are really beautiful to visit, like Hawaii and Chile in particular. Um, and there's a whole astrotourism industry that's grown up in the Atacama Desert in Chile because the, uh, the people who live there recognize that a lot of people, well, they know a lot of professional astronomers come down to use the telescopes in Chile. But they've also come to recognize that a lot of amateur astronomers like to go down there too because the weather is so good and they can uh, camp out in the mountains or go to a resort and see the southern sky uh, in a nice, safe environment. So suddenly you've got astronomical bed and breakfast popping up all over the Atacama oh. Desert. I didn't know that. I was, I was in San Pedro a couple months ago and every other shop had a little like eight-inch telescope in front saying, we yeah. do tours. Uh, yeah. We, yeah. I think we, we managed to... Now. Be late. Yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, don't don't go the day of and try and get a tour, especially if there's major things happening at the observatory. Um, right. We could right. not get one, so we just kind of wandered by ourselves to the edge of town. Uh, but even yeah, even the little tourist shops are now setting up um, sky tours with with yeah. eight-inch telescopes. And there are there are astronomically themed uh, hotels or bed and breakfasts where uh, where they have bigger telescopes and you can go stay there and you know you have an, an expert. Uh, amateur or even a professional astronomer who happens to be doing this on the side. I know there's at least two of those, um, you know, who, and you can plan your vacation around stargazing. Okay. And the Atacama Desert is, you know, for if you just hear about it, you think, oh, a desert, why would I go to the desert? It's one of the most beautiful, exotic places on the planet, and it's got all kinds of interesting things to see. There's geothermal, uh, you know, springs and geysers. There's phenomenal wildlife, uh, the scenery in the desert is spectacular. They've got something called the Valley of the Moon. You, you may have been there yeah. yourself at some point. It's just just spectacular. It is, it is, yeah. The volcanoes really blew me away. Um, <laughs> not, not literally, but yeah, the volcanoes were, were spectacular. Um, we have a question for, from Lourdes uh, asking, how expensive is it to be a, an astro tourist? Either a serious astro tourist, she asks, or, or you know, maybe there's a, a way to do it on a budget for, you know, grad students or recent grad students. Right. Well, you know, travel can be expensive, but it can also be done on a budget. And uh, companies have sprung up to uh, to cover the market from, you know, the high end people who always go, you know, five star uh, to the lower end people who are looking to travel on a budget. And even on something like an Eclipse cruise, um, you can, you know, you can buy an inside cabin for maybe 
a tenth the price of an outside cabin with a balcony and a, and a great view. So, uh, so it's not like there's you know, a set price. Uh, but if you're going to travel internationally, uh, you know, flights can be expensive and so on. But, um, but you know, so, so you might not go to, uh, to an eclipse in a really exotic distant locale. Maybe you'll pick one that's uh, not quite so exotic. Um, actually, there's a great opportunity coming up in the United States. There hasn't been an eclipse that's touched North America since, since 1991, a, sol a total eclipse. Uh, but in August of 2017, just mm -hmm. four and a half years from now, uh, less than that now, uh, there will be an eclipse going diagonally across the United States from the northwest to the southeast. Uh, and so, you know, if you live anywhere within a uh, one or two day drive of the track, uh, which you can find on NASA's Eclipse website, uh, that can be cheap, although you'll want to make uh, hotel reservations as far in advance as possible because yes. uh, people are going to figure this out pretty quickly and everything will book up. Oh, yes. And, uh, yeah, if, if, if you're like me, you know, find a good hostel. Find a decent hostel. You can do exactly. that really cheaply. And also, <laughs> in, the summertime, in the summertime, you can camp. You yeah. Know? I yeah. camped across the country on my honeymoon. At the, time, at the time, you know, we couldn't afford to stay in hotels, so. Yeah, 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 we, uh, get a nice sturdy tent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, oh, I'm looking down through the comments. Uh, Eric Charlin says he planned his next vacation around stargazing at Mont Megantic Darkness Reserve in Quebec, Canada. So mm -hmm. there you go, even, even a dark sky park or, or reserve right. uh, is right. a good place to, to do such a thing. That's right. Yeah, I completely yeah. forgot to mention that, the, the whole idea of uh, traveling to, uh, to dark sky observing events. There were star parties uh, all summer long across the U.S. and Canada. Uh, there's, there's not as many such events in Europe because there are not so many dark sky sites, but many of the biggest star parties in the United States are held in dark sky locations, and so people will go and they'll uh, camp out for a long weekend or even for a whole week. For example, in Texas, the Texas star party lasts for a whole week. And it's just night after night during the dark of the moon, uh, you know, with good weather most of the time. Uh, you bring a telescope or you take advantage of the fact that other people will let you look through their telescopes. Um, it's great, great fun. And these dark sky parks are popping up all over. In, in my experience, amateur astronomers are the, the coolest, most generous people ever. Because I still get really lame with a telescope, with a small telescope, with, a, with an optical telescope of any kind. Um, and, and they'll share their equipment and let you take a look. And, and it's, it's well, really half the fun of astronomy is showing other people the view through a yeah. telescope and watching their eyes light up. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I know of a couple. And sometimes you can merge the dark sky... Uh, Astronomy park type thing with a major observatory. I, I don't. I know more about the radio observatories. Green Bank in West Virginia and the VLA in New Mexico both host big star parties in the summer right. as well. So you right. come, show up, bring your telescope, do a star party, and hang out at a major observatory. Exactly. You get to see big telescopes and meet professional astronomers and talk about the latest research and all of that. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, one of the great advantages of eclipse chasing, especially to places like the southern hemisphere where you don't get to visit very often is by definition total solar eclipses happen during new moon so at night it's always dark and there's no moon so some of the best views i've ever had of the southern sky for example have been during eclipse cruises to the southern hemisphere where you know it's just you're out in the middle of the ocean and if they turn the lights off on the upper decks of the ship you know you're just out there with the universe it's phenomenal oh that's nice that's nice um we've got a couple comments that the the audio or the feed are dropping out. I don't. Um, we're not noticing much of a problem here. Yeah, but, I'm um, hearing you. I'm hearing you. Okay. Any problem. So, so apologies for that. Um, I've got my my Ethernet plugged in, so I don't know uh, if they were just having problems in our neighborhood. Um, of course, this is being recorded, and we'll post. It'll be posted on my channel and on the CosmoQuest channel as soon as we're done. So, sorry about that. If you're missing anything, um, we've got a couple of people talking, Lourdes and Guido, about uh, seeing the Milky Way with their own eyes. Some people, having never left cities, have never seen the Milky Way with their own eyes, and that, that's another good place to start. Right. That's one of the reasons that uh, a lot of people enjoy going camping in the summertime. Mm -hmm. uh, the, at least here in the United States and across Europe, the, uh, the brightest parts of the Milky Way that ever become visible are up in the summer. And so if you can go camping... Uh, and actually plan your trip around when the moon won't be up, you know, when there won't be a full moon or the moon will set early in the evening or not rise till early in the morning. Um, if you get away from cities, uh, you will see the summer Milky Way, and it's just spectacular, and it goes right overhead. 
so it's it's convenient that it's a good time weather-wise to go camping as well exactly. as see the Milky Way. And yeah, if you can get to the Southern Hemisphere, seeing the Milky Way from the Southern Hemisphere is, is mind-blowing. <laughs> There's nothing like it, yeah. It's yeah. so different than in the Northern Hemisphere because you can see the center of the galaxy very, very high up in the sky. And, you know, you really can get a sense of the shape of our galaxy as a, as a flattened disk with a bulge in the center. You can see that with your own eyes. Uh, I've heard people say that if the, um, if, if what, be, if what had become European civilization, if that had grown up in the southern hemisphere, instead of our astronomy being solar system centric, you know, with defining the plane of the sky as the plane of the planet's orbits, uh, we probably would have had a, a galactocentric cosmology because the galactic plane is so visible from the southern hemisphere. Oh, I never thought of that. Much, much more visible than, than the path of the moon and the planets, which you can only figure out by watching them over time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so do you have any, especially with the 2017 total solar eclipse coming up for those of us in, in North America, um, do you have any tips? I found a lot of um, eclipse photography that you've done. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you have some tips for people who are looking to take nice photos of their eclipse, or uh, maybe you want to tell them, don't even try your first time, just enjoy it. Do you have any uh, tips along those lines? Sure. Well, I, I actually do tell people, uh, well, let me back up and say that when I... Generally, when I take an eclipse trip, uh, I find that about half the people on the tour uh, have never seen an eclipse, and the other half are people who go all the time. So it's an interesting mix. You've got a lot of experienced people, as well, yeah, as well as a lot of people who really just you know don't know what they're getting into, but people have told them it's it's really something they should do. I always tell the first timers not to take pictures, okay. and then I tell them how to take pictures because they all want to, right? And everybody's got a phone. Uh, and the phone has a camera, and everybody's brought a camera because they're on a tour, they're visiting, you know, I mean, they're, they're touring, they're going someplace interesting. And one of the great things about a total eclipse is that uh, no matter what kind of camera you have, and no matter what kind of lens you have, uh, you can get a souvenir image that will be worth showing to people. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want a particular kind of image, like if you want a close-up that shows the sun's beautiful corona, the outer atmosphere, um, and shows it, you know, as a nice close-up, uh, you've got to bring pretty heavy-duty gear. You've got to bring a super telephoto lens, you've got to bring uh, a tripod, um, and you've got to practice in advance and make sure you know how to focus because the autofocus isn't going to work. Um, and it takes a lot of effort. So the people who get really, really phenomenally beautiful eclipse photographs, many of them barely even see the eclipse with their eyes. They spend so much of their time working on photography. But if you just hold a point-and-shoot camera up and point at the sky, set it on, uh, you know, set it so the flash won't go off and, and take a few pictures, you'll get something and it'll be your photo, it'll be your souvenir. Okay. Um, the uh, the photos that I've been uh, shooting myself, you know, I, I try to split the difference. I try to spend about half the time looking with my eyes and with binoculars, which gives a really, really nice view, and half the time shooting photos. And I don't bring a lot of heavy-duty equipment. I just bring a handheld camera with an image-stabilized telephoto lens, and I take what I can get. Uh, modern digital cameras have such uh, high sensitivity that you can take... Uh, what you know, you can take the effectively a long exposure without taking a really long exposure. You just crank the sensitivity up and take a short exposure, and it's as if you took a long exposure with less sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So um, the last eclipse that I shot, which was the one in November of last year, um, I got the best pictures that I had ever taken. Um, I still managed to see the eclipse, and I did the whole thing handheld with a telephoto lens with a little image stabilization and high sensitivity. Um, but I've tried on all my previous eclipses to get really good pictures, and I've never managed to get very good pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the rules of eclipse photography is somebody else will always get better pictures than you. <laughs> uh, but the corollary of that is that nobody else can take your pictures for you, right? right. Um, and, you know, uh, so it's, it's worth trying. But certainly if you're going to an eclipse for the first time, uh, it's very important to look. Um, and if we're going to talk about looking at eclipses, we have to... Uh, talk a little bit about safety because it's very misleading, you know, to say go out and look at a solar eclipse. There's different kinds of eclipses. 
uh, certain, well, let's put it this way. You can look at the total phase of a total solar eclipse without any protection. Okay, when the moon is completely blocking the bright disk of the sun, the brightness of the eclipsed sun is about the same as the brightness of a full moon. So it okay. can't hurt it's you. Just from the corona, it, pretty much. Just the corona. That's right. You can you can look at that with your eyes. You can look at that with binoculars. You can even look at it with a telescope. But if any part of the bright disk of the sun is showing, you have to use a special purpose solar filter. And I always always use the phrase special purpose solar filter. You don't want to use something that somebody may have told you, you know, will block enough sun. You don't want to use smoked glass. You don't want to use polarized sunglasses. No. Um, because the problem with these things is even if they reduce the brightness of the sun enough so that it's comfortable to look, they might be passing harmful infrared or ultraviolet light. Uh, infrared is particularly dangerous because it can literally burn the back of your eyeball and you won't feel it. Ooh. So, um, so what we always do on Eclipse Tours is we provide solar filters for all the passengers um, and we tell them if you're bringing a camera or binoculars or a telescope, make sure you buy solar filters in advance and make sure they fit over your optical equipment. Make sure that they fit snugly but not so snugly that you can't get them off during, the to during totality because if you try to look at the total phase with a solar filter, you'll see absolute blackness, nothing at all. Right. right. But you've got to be careful to make sure you've got that back on right before. Right. And one of my jobs when I'm leading an eclipse tour, one of my jobs is to warn people when the sun is about to come back. Do countdown. Um, so I do some kind of countdown. But of course now I'm trying to look at the eclipse, I'm trying to shoot the eclipse, I'm trying to pay attention to how much time there is left on the eclipse, and I'm also uh, worrying about whether uh, you know, sometimes we'll be, for example, on a ship and we'll be dodging clouds and moving around, so I'm having to talk with the captain about that. So there's a lot of things going on at once, um, and it's always rather uh, chaotic. But one of the great things about an eclipse is that when it's about to be over, uh, you can't mistake it. You know, it doesn't just go from, from totality to instant blindness. Uh, the moon is moving across the sun, and it uncovers the edge just slowly enough that you can be prepared for it. Okay, okay. So it's good to have an expert with you if you're going. Um, and it's, 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 even better if the expert, it's, it's even better if the expert actually pays attention to the clock. Yes, that's yeah. true. Which I've been <laughs> so known to do sometimes and known not to do other times. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, we have a, a comment from Giulio Vanini uh, was uh, about re recording it. He says, I would set the camera with a filter to record in video mode with tracking and leave it on automatic and then enjoy the eclipse with my own eyes. So I think that makes sense. I did something similar for my first shuttle launch because I didn't want to mm -hmm. miss it. I just right. set the camera on its own. What I've um, seen people do though, certainly that, that's a great thing to do and I, I usually will turn on a video camera as well but I don't worry about pointing at the sun. I just use it to capture the audio which is as, uh, as much fun as the video when you listen to the, the people's exclamations and and uh, yelling and screaming. Um, what I've seen people do is they'll, they'll set their video camera up, they'll point it at the sun, they'll get it tracking, they'll turn it on, and then they'll get so excited when the total, when, uh, totality happens that they forget to take the filter off. So their video of totality is just black. It's black. Uh, there's nothing yeah. there. um, So again, there's always you know, more than one thing going on and you have to remember what to do. Um, one trick that I no is very useful. I've heard people say that it saved them on many occasions, and which I keep meaning to do but just have never quite gotten around to doing, is to actually record um, on a tape recorder my plan, you know, with the timing all worked oh, out, and okay. play, that, play that through a headphone in one ear so that, you know, it'll say things like, don't forget to take off your solar filter. Don't forget to put your solar filter back on. You know, don't forget to look, things like that. Um, you have to be very organized. So you're uh, choreographing to, to basically. You basically can that. choreograph yeah. it, right, right, <laughs> right. Oh, wow. Um, we've got a suggestion from Peter Lake, who's one of our VSP astronomers, um, pointing out that if you're in Australia, there is a star fest going on October 4th through 6th at the Siding Spring Observatory. Uh, so go to starfest.org.au if you're in Australia and want to go to a major observatory and check out um, another one of these these uh, these events. So yay! Thank you, Peter. Um, and also a recommendation from Guido 
Weaver is saying he'd be really careful pointing digital camera at the sun without filters. He actually got a dark spot on his sensor of his first little camera uh, doing that and has never made that mistake again. So right. there you just go. As, just as you can damage your eyes, you can also damage uh, a video camera or uh, right. any kind of camera because those uh, sensitive those sensors are uh, so extraordinarily sensitive that if you focus sunlight on them, you're going to destroy them. Yeah, yeah. And you can also um, do kind of a pinhole photography using the, you know, I remember the last time we saw a partial eclipse, uh, people were using, um, you know, the light coming through the trees and right. making shadows on the ground. And so you exactly. can see something really spectacular without even looking in that direction. Right. And, and when you're on a cruise ship, for example, uh, it's usually very hard to find a tree. Uh, so uh, people bring, uh, they bring uh, visual aids, okay, to substitute for trees. So I've seen people bring spaghetti colanders, you know, for draining okay. yeah. draining spaghetti. Uh, you, sh you hold the colander up and the sunlight shines through all the little holes and creates these little pinhole projections of crescents or, or uh, the eclipse sun. Um, you can just, you can cross your fingers like this and make, you know, six or eight little pinholes and project that way. Uh, people... Uh, punch holes in a card, like they'll spell out the date and the location, and then they'll project the little crescents on the deck of the ship. And oh, that's clever. That. Yeah. Well, that's clever. That's cool. Um, Cha Erd points, uh, says, I wish more kids could see such an event, and they would have a long-lasting, heartfelt emotion uh, along with that. And, and I think, again, for North American kids in 2017, that's the time to, to do it. Absolutely. I'd, August, maybe when some schools are starting, but I'd expect that schools along the path of totality or even partial um, will allow their kids to go see it, you know. Maybe yeah, start now. Figure out what teacher they're going to have. Right, right. Well, there's always a, there's always a, a very unfortunate phenomenon that occurs uh, when eclipses happen over populated areas, which is mm -hmm. that the uh, the government or, the, or, you know, or local officials or school teachers or somebody will say, oh, it's not safe to look at an eclipse, so we're going to keep you inside. Yeah. Um, and so one of, the, uh, one of the things that I'll be involved in during the years leading up to the 2017 eclipse is uh, spreading the word that it's actually quite safe to look at a solar eclipse as long as you know what you're doing uh, and to try to encourage as many people as possible to see it. Um, it's worth pointing out that all of the U.S. will have a partial eclipse on the day that the total eclipse happens. You have to be within the narrow path of totality, which, as I said, goes from the Pacific Northwest to the mm -hmm. Southeast, to see the total phase. But everybody will get a partial eclipse, uh, even if they're outside that path. So um, basically, the entire country will have a solar eclipse that day. And it would be a terrible shame if uh, people didn't get to look at it, especially if they're in the path of totality or could get to it easily. So we need we need some astronomy ambassadors then to exactly. uh, spread exactly. the word. <laughs> That's right. And like. there's there's a lot of a lot of people planning to to uh, work on that over the next few years. Okay. Um, uh, in addition to the 2017 eclipse, so I was talking again with one of my professors from UVA, Ed Murphy. Uh, he has uh, someone pointed out to him that the path of totality for the 2017 eclipse crosses the path of totality for 2024. Correct. And it's about a half hour away from where I live. <laughs> so hmm. he, he right. has plans to be at that spot both times. Uh, so we're hoping the weather cooperates and hopefully we'll, we'll have an event. Uh, so that's in Illinois. We're going to try and figure out exactly where that is. Um, that's right. Well, try and um, do an event. it's easy to find the maps. Um, yes. Na if you just Google NASA Eclipse website, okay. uh, you'll pull up uh, a page that has maps of where all the upcoming solar eclipses and all the upcoming lunar eclipses are going to be visible. And you can actually see the, the uh, paths for the 2017 and 2024 eclipses. You can see where they overlap. Um, on average, uh, any, any spot on the planet will see a total solar eclipse only once every 400 years or so. Wow. So it's really quite remarkable to have a spot where two eclipses happen only seven years apart. Yeah, uh, yeah. The problem with that location is that uh, in the height of the summer, uh, the weather is pretty unsteady there. Yes. Um, and so, the, you know, if, if you can travel for the 2017 eclipse, which is in August, uh, the best place to see it would be the Pacific Northwest, you know, places like Wyoming. Right. Uh, where the you weather, don't have clouds you know, out there. Where the weather at that time of year is generally pretty reliably clear. Yeah. Um, I forget what time of year the 2024 eclipse is, but uh, whenever it is... April. 
April, not, yeah. So not that's not so great time. either. Yeah. No. It's so, actually part of what my job is to scout out that location and its weather every year. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, kind of there's, all, there's also, um, if you Google eclipse weather, you'll find oh. some websites that, uh, that actually uh, do maps of climatology uh, for upcoming eclipses so that you can see not only where is the eclipse happening, but where are the weather prospects the best. Okay. Oh, that's good. What is that, what is that one to Google, you said? Well, if you Google e uh, eclipse weather... Eclipse weather, and in fact, I'll be even more specific. The, okay. the dean of eclipse weather forecasting is Jay Anderson. He's a Canadian meteorologist okay. and amateur astronomer. Yep, this is so the first one that comes up. Yep, so if you... <laughs> Manitoba. If you, there you go. So Jay, Jay uh, does a complete analysis of every eclipse path, uh, but usually only a, a year or two out. But he also has maps of monthly cloud cover all over the world for every month of the year. So you can look ahead to an eclipse, you know, you can look at the 2024 April, you can look at the April map of clouds and look at where the 2024 path goes and figure out roughly where you'd sure. want to be. But sure. Jay will then uh, publish a very detailed analysis a year or two out and that's what people who are planning tours will rely on because oh, they don't want to just go in the path, they want to go where the where the weather prospects are really good. Sure. We have, we have a saying in eclipse chasing, which is uh, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. Yes. Uh, so Jay would call himself probably an eclipse <laughs> climatologist. Uh, he can predict you know, where the likelihood of clear skies is best, right. uh, but he can't tell you what weather you're going to have that day because you know, that's yeah. not predictable. That far in advance, no one can. Exactly. <laughs> like we've, exactly. we've learned that from just doing astronomy. So, Although, yeah. although where Jay comes in really handy uh -huh. is if you are on a ship, uh, Jay will monitor the weather uh, in the days leading up to an eclipse for each of the ships that's chasing that particular eclipse. And he'll let you know if you need to move. You know, if, oh. if it looks like the if it looks like your target location is going to be cloudy tomorrow at eclipse time, he'll tell you, you know, you should go to the west, you should go to the east, whatever. So you move up or down the track. Oh, and on handy. on several occasions, uh, Jay has uh, has saved my bacon. That's handy. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. And yeah. that, and I think with the with the North American one, you can drive up and down. I mean, more or less, drive up and down the eclipse path as well. So that's right. Although keeping you know, track you're not... in the days to come. Yeah, if you have right. if you know exactly. yeah. if you have a tent and don't mind right. sleeping on the ground. Exactly. An airplane <laughs> right. might be a little more efficient, but yeah, you yeah. can move you can move a few hundred miles one way or the other, which which in most cases will be enough. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Oh, this is just is just getting me so excited for 2017. I'm... Okay. <laughs> um, I notice you have now a little bit more accessible to, to everyone, of course, is the lunar eclipse. Um, so do you have any, uh, any tips for photographing a lunar eclipse? Because, again, that's something people can get a lot more practice with. Right. Well, a great thing about a lunar eclipse uh, is that uh, if the moon is up where you are during the eclipse, you can see the eclipse. Right, uh, you, right. You so don't like have to, planet. Yeah, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to travel. Uh, you know, to a specific location to see a lunar eclipse. So um, it used to be harder with film, but with digital cameras, you know, you get instant gratification. So you can basically, uh, again, if you want to take a close-up like the one you're displaying now, you, you basically need to either shoot through a telescope or with a very uh, high-powered telephoto lens. But uh, the moon is bright enough and it has a nice, well-defined edge that the autofocus will work on the moon. So you can uh, easily autofocus um, on the moon and shoot some exposures, and if they come out too bright or too dark, you can just change the exposure setting. Um, I suppose I should say that um, it is important whenever you're shooting any kind of astronomical phenomenon, whether it's a, an eclipse or you know a, a starry scene or, or the Milky Way or anything, you need a camera that has full manual settings because automatic settings are made for ordinary daylight scenes. And, uh, you know, except for autofocus, basically the exposure meter is just hardly ever going to give you an appropriate setting for a nighttime scene. So, uh, so you experiment. You know, you take a picture, and if it looks like it's overexposed, you just crank the exposure time down.
There you are. Coming back. All right. Are you there? <laughs> I'm here. Okay. Dropped you for a moment. Okay. Okay. We're still live. Sorry about that, everyone. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. I'm not. Did people? Uh, were people able to hear me when you were dropped out? Um, I don't know because I couldn't. Well, I wasn't saying anything important. Once I noticed <laughs> you dropped out, I just, I just. Stopped. Okay. The last, the last I heard was about manu needing manual settings because it's right. Not you basically you you need to be able to control the settings of your camera because they're designed. All the automatic features are designed for ordinary daylight photography, and you know nighttime exposure metering it, it just fools it. So, uh, but the great thing with digital cameras is you can take a picture and adjust on the fly. Um, the uh, you know, again, with an ordinary point and shoot, you can still get a pretty picture. Uh, a total lunar eclipse uh, is really very pretty because the moon turns a sort of coppery color, kind of like a penny. Um, even if you don't have a super telephoto lens, just shooting uh, shooting that in a black sky is very attractive. Um, but if you do have a small telescope that you can shoot through, or if you have a good telephoto lens, you, know, you can get pretty impressive pictures. And you've usually got a few hours to give it a shot. I mean, the That's right. whole eclipse takes a few hours. Right. So a solar not... eclipse, uh, the excitement only lasts a few minutes. Uh, but for a lunar eclipse, it typically, uh, you know, the partial phase lasts an hour on either side, and even the total phase can last an hour or so. Right. right. So you've got plenty of time. Right. Uh, we've got a couple. We lost you. Hopefully we're back. It says we're on air. Um, well, oh, I and then, uh, yeah. Okay, and then uh, Michael Zeller added some links in what I think is the event page comments. If you're watching there, it's a whole bunch of Eclipse maps for 2017, so check that out as well. So thank you, Michael. Uh, Michael Zeller, sorry. You know, oh, Mike. Uh, Mike's online? Okay, great. Yeah, oh, Mike, yes. Mike, uh, Mike is the, uh, well, if, if I called Jay Anderson the dean of Eclipse meteorology, then uh, Mike Zeller would be the dean of Eclipse mapping. Uh, awesome. He, he's doing... Uh, Absolutely, the, the very best mapping work of anybody right now. Cool. Advancing so, um, the state of the art. Excellent. Uh, w would you suggest, uh, do you have any places people could go, you could suggest for them to look up either local or more exotic uh, astro-tourism ventures? Is there some central place to find such things or, or some tips you could give? Well, all of the astronomical tour companies advertise in the two magazines that, uh, that go to amateur astronomers worldwide, Sky and Telescope, where I used to work, and also Astronomy Magazine. Okay. So, for example, the company that I typically travel with called Travel Quest advertises in those places, as do all the others. Um, if you simply Google Eclipse Tour or Eclipse Cruise, uh, you'll find links to all these different organizations. Uh, some of the organizations are big, and the tours have hundreds of people. Some are very small, where it's just you know one guide and fifteen or twenty people accompanying him or her. Um, so it depends on you know what what kind of uh, experience you're looking for. Uh, the price points are different. Uh, some companies, as I said, tend to cater to a higher end, and some you know cater to a broader range. Um, I uh, I've tended to travel uh, in uh, you know in groups that that are spread out where you have people who are really trying to stay on a low budget and people who are willing to pay for the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the captain's suite you know, on, the, on the cruise ship or something yeah. like that. Um, and those people always make me uh, envious because, of course, uh, I think I'm well-traveled until I'm around them. And I realize you know, I've, I've hardly seen any of the world compared to these people who you know, have a lot of money and, and take three or four cruises every year. Oh, um, well, you have been to uh, all seven continents, and I believe both poles. That's right. I'm bipolar. So I don't want to hear it, man. <laughs> I'm bipolar. Um, yeah. Um, I never, uh, never would have imagined it. I mean, I'm, you know, a lot of my travel has been on these astro tours, mm -hmm. uh, where I've been a tour guide. Um, but a lot of my travel has been for other astronomical or even non-astronomical reasons. Uh, of course, whenever I go someplace for a non-astronomical reason, I look for some opportunity to visit an astronomy site uh, simply because I'm interested in it and want to see it. Uh, but uh, when I was working at Sky and Telescope and I was uh, covering astronomy meetings, you know, to write up news articles about what was being discovered and announced, uh, I would travel all over for that. So, for example, that's how I got to Australia. It wasn't for an astronomy tour per se. It was to cover a meeting of the... International Astronomical Union for Sky and Telescope. 
and I got to the South Pole. Uh, it was an astronomy tour, but there was no event in particular. Um, there was no eclipse or anything. Uh, it was just that the uh, this company that I uh, work with, Travel Quest, um, organized a tour to the South Pole. Um, and the first year, um, the guy who runs the company led the tour, and the second year, he offered it to me. So in January of 2006, I found myself camped out in Antarctica and then spent a few days at the South Pole. And of course, uh, if you're into astronomy, you can see the telescopes that are down there. Uh, and there's all kinds of other scientific uh, observing going on. There's meteorology and geology and atmospheric science and all kinds of stuff. Uh, so it's really an exciting place to visit. Um, very cold. Um, <laughs> very, uh, it, it's, you know, I definitely felt like I was out there, that it was the riskiest thing I'd ever done. Flying in these little airplanes, um, you know, where, where they bring an aircraft mechanic and a doctor with you. Uh, you know, that, that just lets you know that you're, you know, you really are Serious. exposed. You know, you're not, this isn't a walk in the park. Um, so when I was at the South Pole, I met a woman who had recently been to the North Pole on a Russian icebreaker, a nuclear-powered icebreaker. Okay. And I thought, what an amazing adventure. Gosh, I wish I could do that someday. And lo and behold, I discover that the 2008 eclipse is going to be visible from the Arctic. So I get in touch with my friends at Travel Quest and I say, hey, do you realize that there's an eclipse in the Arctic and that, they, and that it happens at the time of year when the Russian icebreakers are going up there? Uh, next thing you know, I'm on a North Pole eclipse cruise. Wow. So in 2006, I was at the South Pole. 2008, I was at the North Pole. So that's pretty cool. exciting. That yeah. is cool. Pretty oh, exciting. that's cool. Yeah. So did they show you the telescopes down at the South Pole? I know there's a bunch of the microwave telescopes are down there. That's right. Um, that's right. We hiked out there and we toured the telescopes. Um, you know, it's not, it, 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 they look like radio telescopes, basically. Yeah. And they're, they're itty -bitty. Um, so they're, yeah. Well, the, there's now a 10 meter telescope, although it wasn't there when I was there. That that was uh, erected later. Um, but it's uh, you know it's very impressive, very impressive to the, to think that people work in those conditions um, because it's you know you look at the thermometer on the wall and it says 40 below. Um, now that's outside. <laughs> inside it's not quite so bad, but you have to go outside to get inside. Yes. So uh, yeah, it's the, definitely the coldest I've ever been. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Yeah. But still, worth it. Totally Definitely worth it. it. Definitely oh. worth it. In fact, you know, here again, I, I was offered an opportunity to go back to the South Pole. Uh, but, but the South Pole tours always occur in January, because uh, right. that's the height of the southern summer. And uh, January is when the American Astronomical Society has its big meeting. So, yep. you know, it's just the nature of the beast. You know, Darn. I work for the AAS, so I can't go to the South Pole anymore in January. Oh. But, you know, that's all right. I've been there. Um, I would go back if I could, um, but, you know. I'll cover for you. Once. I'll tell everyone you're sick. It's fine. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to delete that from the recording now. Yeah. Right. Well, actually, what you should do is you should, is you should remind me that, uh, that, you know, that, that you don't have to be at the AAS meeting. You could go to the South Pole. There you go. Right? You yeah. can always, we can Skype you in. That's fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we have the technology. Oh, James Haney points out that the Planetary Society works with Eckhart Tours to put together mm -hmm. great viewing trips, so that's another one. Yep. Uh, and Jim Meeker says, trip to Carbondale in August 2017. That's about where we are, so <laughs> come on out. Yeah, the, uh, not only do the uh, tour companies all advertise in Sky and Telescope and Astronomy, but both magazines run their own tours. As I said, that's how I got into it. Um, the Planetary Society runs tours. The Astronomical Society of the Pacific runs tours. They're based in San Francisco. Um, and, uh, yeah, those, usually if you travel with those organizations, you get to go along with, you know, the editors of their magazines or the astronomers on their staffs, that kind of thing, uh, which can be a lot of fun, especially if you're a member of those organizations or you read those magazines. Um, and then... Uh, you know, if you if you want to travel with former editors of Sky and Telescope, you hook up with Travel Quest. Cool, very cool. I need to figure out how to get in on this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it sounds like it's a great gig. If you fun. can get it, it's a great gig. Yeah, yeah this really sounds is. super fun. I'll do I'll do the ones that visit radio observatories. How's that? <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, so unless we have any last questions, I'm not seeing any last questions coming up. 
Um, are you going to be in, speaking of double A's, are you going to be in Indianapolis in a couple weeks by any chance? That's right. Our, well, oh yeah. Uh, there's no chance about it. I, uh, I run the press <laughs> operation at the right. double A's meeting. So uh, okay. yeah, we have five press conferences scheduled uh, awesome. during the first week of June. Awesome. And uh, yeah, I can always plan. I know my uh, where I'm going to be every six months for several years out because yeah, the they plan the well in advance. Are planned far in advance, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll be going to the uh, to the eclipse this November. Um, it's November third, and uh, it crosses the Atlantic Ocean, uh, the North Atlantic Ocean, and then um, the tail end of the eclipse happens in Africa. Oh. So there are some groups that are going to places like uh, Uganda and Kenya, uh, Ethiopia. They're going to have a very short eclipse. It'll be just you know thirty or forty seconds right. because they're at the very tail end of the track, and it's a very narrow track. I'll be on a cruise ship uh, off the coast of uh, Sierra Leone. And I'll get about a minute and a half of totality. Uh, so you know, it's some people would would say you're crazy. You take a two week trip for a minute and a half of a solar eclipse. Um, but one of the things about well, first of all, a minute and a half of a solar eclipse is is worth it. You know, it's so spectacular. And and only if you've seen one can you appreciate that it is worth devoting two weeks of your life to see it. But more than that, all of these astronomical tours are designed so that even if the event is clouded out, you're still going to have a great time. Because oh, sure, there's lots know, of other things going on in those. Exactly, days. you're gonna well, you're gonna get to visit exotic locations. You're right. gonna spend a week on a cruise ship, or you're gonna spend a week on safari in Africa, or something like that. So you know, you're going to have a wonderful adventure, and if you're lucky, and the clouds. You know, cooperate and the and the weather is good. You're going to also see, you know, one of nature's grandest spectacles, something that will, uh, you know, just delight you to no end and cause you to then start planning all your vacations around future eclipses. Excellent, excellent, cool. Uh, Greedo Bibra pointed out that uh, I'll have glass soon, so there we go. Astronomy travels with Google Glass, so <laughs> I can I can have that niche <laughs> that niche market. Sounds good. Uh, yay! Just, excellent. I wonder if they'll put out a Google Glass edition that has uh, solar filters built into it. That would be cool. I yeah. know that they have little sunglasses that clip into it. That so, makes sense. you know, uh, yeah. other than that, I'm just going to be duct taping, you know, the paper ones that they exactly. give out from NASA. <laughs> right. right. So, uh, Phil Shoot. Work. Hi, Phil. Says, uh, took mine to Mexico in 1991. Best seven minutes of my life. This sounds like the one that, that, you, that you started. Started yep. you. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Um, all right, so I want to thank you, Rick, for joining us. This was, was really very fascinating, welcome. very interesting. Um, expect more questions from me as the eclipses come by. <laughs> um, and uh, to everyone watching, thank you. Thank you for the comments and questions. Um, we have today's Wednesday, so the next hangout. I know Planetary Society does one on Tuesdays at noon Pacific. I don't know what their topic is this week. I'll have to look that up for the next broadcast. Uh, on Friday, we have the Weekly Space Hangout. That's at noon Pacific, and we'll be rounding up all your astronomy stories from the week. So Fraser Kane's back in town. I'm, I'm back in town, so we'll have a regular space hangout for you guys. And then Sunday night is the virtual star party with uh, Fraser Kane and Scott Lewis at, um, oh, some ridiculously late time. I think it's 9 p.m. Pacific now. Uh, sorry, East Coasters. Uh, you know, blame the sun, not us. It hardly um, gets dark till then anyway for the I East know. Coast. I know, I know. So, uh, you know, if you are an amateur astronomer and want to participate in the virtual star party, we are definitely looking for people in different time zones so we can run different shows. Um, so do you have any, any last uh, words of, of wisdom or excitement, Rick, about uh, astrotourism in general that you want to leave with? Well, I would just say that uh, until you've seen a total solar eclipse or you've seen a bright display of the aurora, you really can't understand why people get so excited about it. Uh, certainly in the case of a solar eclipse, you really owe it to yourself if you have an opportunity at any time in your life to see one, to take advantage of it. Uh, you won't necessarily have to spend you know, thousands and thousands of dollars to do it. Um, the North American eclipse is a great opportunity for a lot of people. Uh, there will be more eclipses in Europe and more eclipses in South America. Uh, just find a way at some point in your life to see a total eclipse of the sun because you will not regret it. So the pictures don't do it justice, huh? Pictures don't do it justice. The, uh, the light is uh, of such a quality that you really can't capture it, you know, at least not, not the way it really looks in real life. You know. In fact, I, it's kind of embarrassing. You know, I'm the leader of, of an eclipse tour when I go on it, and 
uh, even if I've seen, I mean, I've seen nine total eclipses. Uh, I'm still dumbstruck when totality begins because even though I've looked at my own pictures and looked at other people's videos, you know, when that moment comes and the sun's completely covered and the corona comes out, it's so beautiful, it's so breathtaking that, you know, I, I don't remember how stunningly beautiful it was until it happens again. And so I momentarily just am completely caught up in it. Uh, I forget to keep narrating. I forget what time it is, you know, and I'm just, because it's that moving and that exciting. So, uh, you know, you, you can't possibly get jaded. Um, I know people who've seen 15 or 20 and, you know, they just keep going because everyone's different. The sun is active. It's doing different things at different times. The shape of the corona changes. Uh, the beautiful little uh, red prominences that jut out from the limb are different. Uh, the size of the moon relative to the size of the sun is different. So, you know, everyone is different. Um, it, you know, uh, I, I was hoping you wouldn't, and thankfully you didn't ask me what was my favorite eclipse. No, it's, yeah. it's, like asking, it's like asking, you know, uh, which of your children is your favorite. It's just, <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't do it, you know. They're, yeah. they're, everyone is, is uniquely special. Excellent, excellent. Well, you've sold me. Uh, I totally can't wait now. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Um, You're very and welcome. Thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you next week on Learning Space.